Well, hey, good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well. I'm actually recording this on a Sunday morning. People are going to be coming here in a little bit. Um, I did record the message earlier, but there's some updates I wanted to give and, and some good news. So we're re-recording on a Sunday morning. We had a great time last night. We were able to pray for somebody after the service was over. And we're looking forward to see what God is going to do here in a little bit when people start showing up. Uh, but I did want to give an update and, and give... Uh, some good news. We have some good news to share with you. The first one is this. You know, churches are meeting this morning. Big churches are meeting. Churches much, much bigger than us. 20 times bigger, and then even bigger than that. The church that I used to serve at, which has been cautious and careful during COVID, they're having an indoor service this morning. I hope you find that encouraging. I hope you find that to be good news. Uh, so be encouraged by that. The second piece of good news is that we're getting ready to sign a lease for our building for 2021. This place feels so much like home. We, we love this spot so much. Sometimes I forget that we don't own it. We, we are tenants and we rent it. The lease, is, the rent is going up a little bit, even more than a little bit, but um, it's still much, much less than the rent we pay at the middle school for all that time. And the building just works out great. You know, we have access to it all the time. And so we're so happy that God's allowed us to use the building in 2021. And even though the rent is going up, you have been so generous that uh, it's still very easy for us to manage. In fact, you've been so generous, you need to know this, that since March, since COVID happened, our little church has given away over $10,000 to help people with their rent, to help people with their groceries. We bought a used wash machine for somebody. Um, we've been able to help out different organizations and a different church as well, a partnering church. And um, so our little church, because of your generosity, we've been able to give $10,000 away. I hope you find that encouraging. Again, just thank you. And the last thing I wanna share this morning is an announcement. We're gonna have three Christmas Eve services this year. We're going to have one at 5.30, we're going to have one at 7.30, 7 and 8.30, 5.30, 7 o'clock, and 8.30. And um, the more opportunities we have, the more, you know, flexibility we can show, the more people are able to jump in at different times. And uh, we might even have an online service. We're going to see how that works out. But I want to let you know about that, 5.30, 7, and um, 8.30 for Christmas Eve services. They're going to be short. Um, the Christmas story and some Christmas carols and some uh, candles, electric candles. So I hope you're able to join us in one of those three times. <clears throat> All right, so this morning's message. There's a lot of differences between an adult and a kid. Sometimes those differences are seen at Christmas more than any time else. Kids are all about the presents at Christmas. The P-R-E S-C-N-T-S, -S, the presents that we can open up on Christmas morning and enjoy. Adults value a different kind of presents. They value the P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. They value the relationships, the togetherness. Kids want presents. Adults want presents. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E -E kind of presents. We all have people in our lives that are really hard to buy a Christmas present for because they really don't need anything. What they value is the relationship. They'd much rather have their kids and grad kids presents than just something that they can open up under a tree. And I hope that's true for us as believers, that we value God's presents, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, more than we value the presents that we're going to open up on Christmas morning. We're doing a real short Christmas series called No Fear Christmas, and how we should be able to walk this life without fear because of Christmas. And this morning, we're gonna talk about the value of God's presence. God's P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, because God's presence brings peace and rest. This morning, the, Christmas, the, the passage is the Christmas story a part of it from Luke chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them, to shepherds, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were terrified. The shepherds were scared silly. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And then Matthew one twenty three gives us another valuable glimpse of the Christmas story. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. You might know that Emmanuel means God with us. There's some significant differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. As much as they work together and complement each other, there's also some significant differences. And one of those differences in the Old Testament, God dwelled in a temple. In the New Testament, he dwells with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. Because God is with us, we can enjoy his presence. There's three real quick points of interest I'd like to make about the, this story, this passage in Luke chapter two. Uh, the first one is this. You know, as a class, shepherds had a very bad reputation. They were considered unreliable, and I didn't know this, they were not even allowed to give testimony in a court of law. So why would the angel announce the birth of a savior to such an unreliable group of people? Why this group? <clears throat> Interesting question, it's a good question. What I glean from it is that God is never concerned about having a press agent if God had a press agent that said, hey, you've got some good news. You don't want to share it with, you want to share it to the high and the mighty, the well-known, the, the respectable kind of people. The fact that God reveals himself to shepherds shows to me that God just loves to work contrary to our expectations. I find that very comforting. We all have a way of thinking that God should do this and God should do that. God's going to do what he's going to do, and it's going to be contrary to what we call human wisdom. I hope you find some comfort to that. The second thing is that, you know, the angel announced the birth of a savior, not an advisor, not a provider, not a society reformer or a life coach, but a savior. We have to ask the question, what are you expecting Jesus to do? The Christmas story is about Jesus coming to die, to live, and then to die for our sins. What are you expecting Jesus to do? Sometimes we place expectations on Jesus that, that aren't really there. And the last thing, the third point, there is a huge contrast between the angelic glory and the humble Jesus. It's quite extreme. We have the magnificence of this heavenly host praising God. And what are they praising God about? a baby that's lying in a manger, which is a nice way of saying he's living in a barn. He's wrapped in cloth and he's probably doing what babies do. God loves to put his glory in unlikely packages so his glory is more clearly displayed. Now that's not just something from the past. That's played out in our lives as well. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But get this. <clears throat> but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Here the scripture describes us as a jar of clay. But God's surpassing power is seen in us. God loves to put his glory in unlikely packages. In the Christmas story, it's the baby Jesus. To a much lesser degree, his glory is seen in us. We are jars of clay. Another question I want to ask, are you ever envious of the shepherds? 
the shepherds enjoyed a big wow kind of moment. They experienced God's presence. They didn't seek it, it just happened. And if we're not careful, <clears throat> we might not think about it, but in some ways we can be passive and just kind of wait for God to give us a big wow moment. But we need to be more intentional. If we're going to enjoy God's presence, we need to do three things. The first one is this. We need to focus on God's word and God's character, God's truth and the attributes of who he is. We tend to focus on emotion. We tend to focus on circumstances. What do you focus on? <clears throat> we can focus on good things. Our kids, our spouse, our family, our job is a necessary thing to focus on. It's good and sometimes healthy to focus on sports and hobbies. We tend to focus on the news and social media. What do you put your focus on? I think it's important to ask that question. If we want to enjoy God's presence, we need to focus on his truth. <clears throat> and we need to focus on who he is. We as a church are going to provide everybody a free membership to the Dwell app in January. It's a Bible app. It's great. There's a lot of them out there, but this one's really good. So we'll have you more information about that and how you can access this free app. It's free to you. We're paying a little bit. 2021 is coming. Some people start a reading plan for the new year. You might want to consider that. On Sunday mornings and Saturday nights, um, we pass out a little handout. Um, in the past, we've had questions to help people dig into God's word. In the, coming, in the week that's to follow, the questions are going to be back. In fact, in January, if you're able to join us on a Saturday or Sunday, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to spend some time on Saturday and Sunday equipping people how to dig into God's word. We need to focus on God's truth, and we need to focus on God's character. I've probably mentioned it, I know I've mentioned it before. When we lived in Indiana, I was kind of in a difficult time of life. And someone said, you need to just focus on the attributes of God. So I read a book. It was kind of hard for me to understand. It led to me writing my own little book on the attributes of God. It's called 25 Facts of God. If you're curious, uh, just shoot me an email. Let me know or a text. And I'll be happy to email you uh, a PDF version of the book. It's 25 Attributes of God. And if you focus on who God is, you will enjoy his presence so much more easier. God's word, God's character are the only rocks worthy of building our life on. Everything else truly is a house uh, built on the sand. The second thing we need to do, we need to focus on God's truth, God's word, but we also need to pursue his presence. God desires our pursuit of him. Presence requires some effort on our part. We just can't sit around passively and wait for a big wow moment like the shepherds. Some great passages. Psalm 145, 18. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. James 4, 8. Come close to God and God will come close to you. And then Hebrews 4, 11. Think on this. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Now, sometimes we read that passage and we think, that seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Make every effort to enter that rest. The New King James Version uses a different phrase, and I found it helpful. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. <clears throat> be diligent. Rest is there. God's presence is there but he doesn't force it on us. We must enter it. We must appropriate it. Clearly, rest is entered by faith. It takes faith if we want to enjoy God's presence. It takes a diligent faith. Faith is not passive. It takes diligence to do these three things, to trust in, rely on, and cling to Jesus and his work for us. There is some diligence. Rest, peace, and presence are available to us. But faith, an act of faith, is what gives us the ability to enter into it. How do you pursue God? 
I want to share with you seven different ways that sometimes God has wired us to enjoy his presence. Real quick, relationally, some people grow spiritually. Spiritual growth comes naturally when you're involved in significant relationships. When you're with other people, when you're fellowshipping with others, that's when you experience God's presence. Intellectual, your love of scripture comes naturally. You're a thinker. You're drawn to facts and knowledge. We know people like this too. They experience God's presence when they're digging in and chewing on God's word. Worship, you have a deep love for personal and corporate praise and a natural inclination for celebration. There are some people experience God's presence in, in, in a really tangible way when they are worshiping God. There's other ones too. Activist, you have a strong sense of vision and passion to build the church in God's kingdom. Some people feel closest to God. They enjoy his presence when they're actively doing something to grow the kingdom in a significant way. Contemplative, you connect with God through time alone. Reflection comes naturally to you. So some people experience God's presence just in those times of quiet. Some people experience God's presence when they're serving. When you are helping others, God's presence seems most tangible. When you are doing something physically for somebody else, you probably know people like that as well. Maybe that's you. You experience God's presence when you are doing something to serve others. And the last one I wanted to share is creation. You respond deeply to God through nature. Being outdoors replenishes your spirit. The scripture says God reveals himself in his creation. For some folks, being in a deer blind is a really religious experience because they enjoy God's presence when they're in nature. So if we want to enjoy God's presence, we need to focus on God's word, God's character. We need to pursue him and appropriate the rest that's available. And the last thing we need to do is we may need to eliminate the things that hinder. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. When we see that passage, it's real easy to focus on that second part, the sin that so easily entangles. If you're entangled in sin, sin is like static. Remember we used to have phone calls and there'd be static on the line? Sin interferes and it hinders our relationship. It hinders our experience in God's presence. But the passage says, throw off everything that hinders. Maybe it's good things. Not necessarily sinful things, but things that hinder us in our relationship. Last night we had 19 people here, I think. And if I would have asked that question, what hinders you? There might be 19 different answers. We all need to ask that question. What things in our life, not necessarily bad and sinful things, but what are the things that might hinder us from experiencing more of God's presence? The last thought I want to share with you is that the world looks for peace in the outward things, circumstances. As believers, peace is available because of God. We need to live from the inside out, not the outside in. There was a first century pagan writer. His name is Epictetus, I think. E-P-I-C-T-E-T-U-S. First century pagan writer. He, this is what he had to say. Interesting. While the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart, for which man yearns for more than even outward peace. In our culture today, people are looking for peace, but they're looking at it from they're looking for it from external places from the circumstances, from the government, from, from the life that they have. And even this first century pagan writer recognizing you know, the emperor cannot provide you peace. Outward peace doesn't, doesn't work. It, peace comes from inside. 
And only God can give us that peace that we're longing for. Our circumstances will never give it to us. Even this first century pagan writer recognized that. The challenge this morning, the three things to ask. How can you better focus on God's word and God's character? Not just in the coming weeks, but in the coming year. How can you better focus on God's word and his character? Pursue. How can you be more diligent to enter into the rest? How can you be more diligent to pursue God's presence? And again, one of those seven things that I mentioned, maybe one of those things was highlighted to you and it resonated more. And the last thing is, what are the things that hinder you? It's important to ask. What are the things that might be hindering you in your relationship, hindering you in your, in your ability to enter into God's presence? So thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope we're able to see you again sometime soon. Again, Christmas Eve, 5.30, 7 and 8.30, if you're able to join us. Our groups will be smaller, the more time, more people, the more opportunities to meet, the smaller our groups will be. So we're looking forward to, uh, again, seeing you sometime soon. And again, just thank you. It's important, again, go back to that idea of honoring. We need to honor everybody, no matter where they're at in this unique time of life. So we honor you. And um, yeah, again, thank you so much for joining us. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye.